I want to start by drawing your attention to the picture on the front of the bulletin this morning. It's a picture that Mitch saw on Facebook a couple of weeks ago, and he shared it with me, and I immediately thought, we need to preach about this picture. For those of you who are watching online, the picture is of a message that's written on a bright red garage door in chalk, and it says, it's okay to be heartbroken for more than one group of people at a time. If there was ever a message that I wanted to share with everyone I knew right now, that is it. I want to share it with the protesters on the college campuses. I want to share it with the counter-protesters on the college campuses. I want to say to them, it's okay. No, no, it's not okay. It's crucial to be heartbroken for more than one group of people at a time. It's crucial to be heartbroken for what happened on October 7th when Hamas attacked Israel. It's crucial to be heartbroken for the devastation that's been wreaked upon Gaza, 35,000 almost killed, a third of them children. It's crucial to be heartbroken, to be devastated for, by the fact that all of the all of the military and all of the attacks that have been done in the last months have not done anything to bring home the hostages or make anyone safer or free Palestinians. It is all heartbreaking and devastating, every bit of it. And I believe that the ability to be heartbroken is what makes us human. And the ability to be heartbroken for more than one group of people at a time is part of our humanity. It's not simple. It's complicated. It's not comfortable. It's messy. And it's part of who we are as people of faith. We recognize the pain in everyone, whether they're our tribe or not. In today's lesson from John's Gospel, is at the very end of Jesus' ministry. And Jesus tells his followers in an extended goodbye speech, this is my commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. I believe that to love someone with agape love, biblical love, is to let their pain break our hearts, to let somebody else's pain break our hearts. So I might, if I were making a a, a loose paraphrase of today's reading, I might write, love one another Be heartbroken for one another, as I have loved and been heartbroken for you. There is no greater love than to lose one's life, one's ego and fear-based life, in order to dedicate one's greater life on behalf of one's friends. And one's friends is, in Jesus' heart, all of humanity, all of creation, everyone and everything. Here is a a key thing about agape love. It is not, with apologies to Tina Turner, a secondhand emotion. It is not an emotion at all. Love in a biblical sense is a decision, a decision to live on behalf of another and for the well-being of another, especially when the other is someone who has been othered, has been marginalized and treated as less than fully human, less than a beloved child of God. Love is a decision to enter into the complexity of a situation, seeking solutions that can heal not just my tribe, 
but everyone. Love is a decision to let ourselves be heartbroken. Mm. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Last Sunday evening, Dr. Rebecca Copeland was here giving the Ed Mark Lecture for this year. Some of you were present, and I know some of you watched it online. <clears throat> she spoke about the challenges that face us from climate change, and in particular, she spoke about environmental racism, the way toxic waste sites are almost universally located next to communities where poor people live, and usually poor people of color, next to those communities that have the least resources to be able to fight against corporate greed and government laxity, for lack of a better term. And Dr. Copeland, <laughs> beautifully, if uncomfortably, mm -hmm. <laughs> acknowledged what the case is for most of us when it comes to climate change. We know it exists. We know it's a problem. We know that our lifestyle is part of the reason it's a problem. We feel guilty, and then we get stuck. Because we don't know how to fix it, it's too big, and so we do nothing. That's an ouch. Yeah. Does that feel familiar? Dr. Copeland, in her lecture, said that she doesn't have an ultimate solution for the complexities of climate change. But she did offer a straightforward solution to the paralysis of our guilt, though, which was essentially do something, do anything. She told story after story about ordinary people who were heartbroken for their neighbors and their friends. And in that heartbreak, they got educated about the specifics of the environmental crisis in their own setting. And they got to work to change the situation where they lived and worked. Their heartbreak has made a real positive difference and continues to do so. And Dr. Copeland challenged us to lean into the problem of climate change in our own locations. Someone in the, in the congregation asked, what's one simple thing we can all do? And she said, Google climate organizations in Cambridge or Arlington, or Jamaica Plain, or Medford, was her immediate response. Get informed, then get involved. Be part of making something better. In light of today's readings, in light of that sign on the garage door, I would say that what Dr. Copeland said to us is, love the world and its people enough to be heartbroken about the disaster of climate change, and love enough, lay down your life enough to learn to mobilize your pain and the pain around you. Let the energy of your heartbreak mobilize your ability to make a response, literally your responsibility, right? Start by educating yourself and then begin to put what you learn into practice. Take responsibility for what you can. It's not going to solve everything. And it may not solve anything very fast. So get started now. Speaking of solutions long coming and long overdue, this has been a completely astounding week for the United Methodist Church. I, in just a few days, the general conference of our denomination removed 52 years of accumulated unjust, harmful language in our book of discipline and our social principles. So that, 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 that blocked ordination and marriage of queer folk, gone. With, with votes that were 75 to 93% positive. I'm, 
I'm still pinching myself uh, because we've been fighting for this to happen for our entire career and continually running into an unyielding wall of refusal and fear. For decades, fear ran General Conference. Back in the 70s and 80s and 90s, when we were seminarians and baby pastors, it was queer, a fear of queer folk that ran the discussions at General Conference. And then, later, when we weren't scared anymore, it was fear of losing the conservative churches in our denomination that drove the conversations in the last couple of decades. Now, many of those conservative churches, 25% of our churches, uh, did leave. Maybe they saw the chalk writing on the garage door. And this year, thank you, Holy Spirit of God, love spoke instead of fear. And the general conference removed every bit of the hateful, fearful language that has paralyzed us for so long. It is such good news, small g, and, 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 Good news, it is the good news, <laughs> lived out, capital G, capital N. We're a new United Methodist Church. Thanks be to God. I have to admit, in, in the midst of all the excitement, it's a little destabilizing, right? I feel like I've been pulling on one end of a tug of war rope for 40 years, and all of a sudden the person on the other hand just let go of their rope. And all week, I've been a little off balance. <clears throat> and when it was happening, when the numbers were so, po so thoroughly positive this week, this voting and the change seemed like it was inevitable. But it wasn't inevitable. What happened this week was the result of half a century of protest, of slow and steady and painful work by heartbroken LGBTQIA folk and their allies year after year, quadrennium after quadrennium. The United Methodist Gay Caucus began in 1975 and then transformed into the Reconciling Congregations and Reconciling Ministries Network has worked tirelessly at the local church and conference and general conference level. Many churches like this one, like Harvard Epworth, have been part of that reconciling movement, have made public stands for full inclusion and equal marriage and ordination. Our former pastor, Reverend Scott Campbell, as Lane mentioned during the prayer time, did incredible and amazing work to support clergy who were being brought up on charges because they disobeyed what they saw as an unjust church law. The denomination changing votes this week could happen because for 50 years, people were heartbroken and put their heartbreak into action for marginalized folk in our denomination. It wasn't pretty, it wasn't easy, and a lot of people got hurt in the process. Thank you for for your witness at prayer this morning. I was, as you brought up, I, a dear friend of ours from seminary, who I think back in 1992 gave up her orders, uh, Christine Wagner, uh, to the Iowa conference. Uh, and it's a loss. And it's us. a loss and that's to only, us, to the United Methodist Church. There are so many others. And so right? thousands of others who have been left on the side of the road. So we hold that heartbreak, even as we celebrate that finally the change has come. And I want to um, just call out our graces this morning, uh, Grace Killian and Grace Sill, who are there on behalf of the Connectional Table and have brought reports back from that 
You were in our prayers this week. In light of all that has happened at General Conference this last week, makes us wonder what will change in the way that we do ministry at Harvard Epworth. And the answer is, I think, not much. We will continue to be in ministry as imperfect and loving followers of Jesus Christ, working as we always have been to expand our welcome and our celebration of all the diversity of all of God's children, and we will continue to be brokenhearted for those who are marginalized. The great early 20th century preacher Harry Emerson Fosdick wrote, always the universe is there first, and our powers and our Capacities are but responses to something outside ourselves. If fish have fins, he wrote, it is because the water was there first. If birds have wings, it's because the air was there first. If we have eyes, it is because the sun was there first. And if we love each other, It is because God's love was there first. We love because God first loved us. And so we want to make this suggestion for you this morning. The places in your life for which you are heartbroken, don't just push those aside. Let that heartbreak show you how God is calling you to love the world. Let that heartbreak strengthen your ability to respond to what is before you and be willing to be heartbroken for more than one group at a time. Be asking yourself, Where does my heart break? Where has God begun to crack open a place of love in me? And go there, bearing the love of Christ with you.